first of all, I wanted to, you know, I was sitting here as you all came in. So I was watching you. And it turns out that this is a, a different audience. No, you know, I'm used to an audience of students and young architects. And now it turns out that everybody here is closer to my age than the student's <laughs> age, which I take personally as a compliment. Because first of all, to get you out in this crappy weather is great, and I really appreciate it. That's number one. Number two, I appreciate your coming to engage in architecture in a way, which brings me to the subject that I'm going to talk about tonight. Now, normally, you're used to seeing images, and, and I do have 10 images, that's all. Um, but I want to talk about something else tonight. Um, just before I began, uh, the archivist and his assistant from the Burnham Library uh, uh, is here, Nathaniel Parks. And I, I want to talk a bit about ethics. And in the context of ethics, what it is that, the, that one of the several obligations that falls on an architect squarely, in my view, which is not about uh, the greening of the society, it's not about respect that one has for an other, uh, to paraphrase a well-known French philosopher, uh, but to talk about uh, the, the need to critique something, to, to criticize something or someone, but to do it in, a, in an ethical and in a certain sense in a nice way, in an age where not everything is always so nice. Um, so I want to start out with this first image which is uh, a lithograph that I did courtesy of then the curator of the architecture at the Art Institute, John Zukowski, who was here tonight. Um, he, he commissioned a number of us, Tom Beebe, Elmo Jan, and I to do lithographs. So working with a stone, I did this litho. Um, and it's called career collage, and indeed, at the time, this was done 20 years ago, or some number like that. At that time, this was all of the buildings that I had done up to that point, or projects that didn't get built. Um, so while I'm not in talking about my work in a certain way, uh, the idea is to, that your building is as a critique of a status quo. One of the reasons that I am such a fan of Jeannie Gang is very simple. She is a courageous, brave person, period. I'm not gonna belabor that with details in her buildings, but suffice to say that her buildings are brave. I know this to be fact because I once commissioned her to do something at the National Building Museum that failed. And by failure, it doesn't mean collapse, it means visible deflection, which means that she took something to the edge of where it was supposed to go, just beyond the edge, so you could define the edge. That to me was stunning, it was shocking actually, and brilliant. I think that a part of being an architect was being brave, always. Uh, little known, in 1946 or seven, a uh, former rabbinic student and a German emigre presented their drawings for a high rise a pair of IRIs to be built in Chicago. And the mortgage banker looked at it and said, but where's the building? It was, of course, 
Herb Greenwald and Mies van der Rohe, and the buildings were 816, 880 Lakeshore Drive. What it took to get a mortgage to build courageously, to build something that had never been done in this country at least, uh, required a level of toughness that Mies had, as did Herb Greenwald. Uh, and so for me, the architects that I've always admired were brave. And by brave, I mean that they were willing to use their buildings and their concepts as a critique of the society that was extant at the time that they designed, the stuff that they designed. So these buildings that I did that are, that are on the screen right now were done as a criticism at varying scales. I mean, the unbuilt stuff at a giant scale, built stuff at a small scale, but in any case, always as a critique. Uh, so the first thing is something called the formal generators of structure. Um, in 1964, where I had broken a partnership with Norm Coughlin and started out on my own then uh, at a small one-room office at 664 North Michigan uh, in a building that has been replaced. Um, I had a student come in at night named Gordon Crabtree, and he made what turned out to be 78 drawings. Uh, these are uh, 18 of the, of the 78. Um, and they were called the formal generative structure. I was trying to find a language that, from which I could operate, that could be an architect. And to understand the language, I needed to, to talk about the square, the rectangle, the pinwheel, the linked figure, the lozenge, whatever these things were. And so I needed to find for me, the authentic, the authenticity at the root of those forms. Uh, and so we made these drawings. As a result of that, one of the first things that came out of that was something called Instant City, which is a project that was designed to be built over the Eisenhower Expressway or over expressways ad nauseum unendingly. Um, and, you know, it's interesting when you look back on, on your own work, uh, it was, a, it was a, this was an incredible moment for me because when I had, when the model was built and I actually saw it, I realized that I had done something. I had done, probably I was 36 at the time. It was the first thing that I had done that was mine. That I had, I mean, not that there weren't antecedents, Gropius had something fairly similar, not entirely, in, the, in Germany in the 20s. Uh, but this was, at some authentic level, mine, of my own concept. In other words, that, that, I, that didn't borrow from recent antecedents that didn't, as Bob Stern always likes to jokingly say, if you copy, you should make sure that the people are dead. <laughs> you don't want to copy from people that are alive. Uh, but so Gropius had died when I did this, that's for sure. Um, but his was sufficiently different that you, there was a marked difference. Um, but, it, but the buildings posited the, the concept was, was, a, was a critique of several things. One of the tall building is a cantilever, because the tall building is a cantilever and is problematized, which you see Jeannie Gang's recent thing on the river, which you, right here, which you can see the three towers are brilliant because when you place a convex form next to a concave form, it, it a priori by definition resists lateral load wind load, which is more important 
than compression, com compression upon a building. Uh, so this was by, by doing these tetrahedra, uh, but attaching them, one was avoiding the cantilever. This is a critique of the tall building, which is what's fabulous about stuff going on today is that many of the really fine architects worldwide, and there's an exhibit that right here in this uh, center, in the Chicago Architecture Center, that when Lynn took Margaret and I around the other month, but recently, of tall buildings, she has many of the recent tall projects, built or not, and they are all, in one way or another, studies in resistance to lateral loading. Okay, so to me, coming out of the formal generated to structure, that was very important. The next thing that came about was something called, uh, it was a floating city to be done off of Chicago and Lake Michigan. Again, using tetrahedra on cables with female male connection uh, devices to the lake bottom. Um, but again, it's a study of how to build without engaging a single the t tall building. Not that I myself haven't done the conventional tall building. I've done two of them, Boardwalk and Pensacola. But this to me was a more ideal way to go because it was a critique of something that was out there. This was also a critique. Um, in the background, as you know, is the Baha'i Temple. So in the, in the late 70s, I think I did this. This was, we were commissioned to do the National Archives Center for the Baha'i Faith, uh, which is on Axis, as you see. They, they own property on both sides of Sheridan Road. So this is on the east side, overlooking, right on the lake, uh, on one of the nine axes of the Baha'i Temple. And so they sent me to Haifa, where the, the Baha'i Faith originated, etc. cetera. Um, and this was a, the, as, as a, is a subject of criticism of, you know, we build in nature or on nature or of nature. Frank Lloyd Wright built in the context of being at one with nature. Mies and Philip Johnson and all of those who were the descendants of Mies uh, built on nature because it's always, Mies buildings are always on a plinth. The plinth only, only may be one step and it may be of, of fine material, either very antique or a, a travertine, but it's lifted up as, as a, in, in a certain sense as a metaphor of a temple. The building stands in opposition uh, to nature, as opposed to being of nature. This suggested that buildings are only half of the truth, and the other half reside, resides in nature. So that led to me, uh, for me, in 1975, seven architects at Chicago Seven had an exhibition at the Richard Gray Gallery. Richard Gray was recently deceased. Um, and I did a project called The Little House in the Clouds, which was the precursor to this project for the Baha'is, which is basically a building, which is a half of something, the, the other half of which is a treed form. So you see the trunks of the trees in the right hand with the tree carved as topiary, and on the other side, a mirror, basically glass, on columns uh, being the built side. So one is about nature, the other is about humankind. And it felt to me appropriate as the archive. It never got built because the, the Baha'is, uh, the village of Wilmette challenged building on what was riparian right, rights on the water are near the water's edge, so it never got built. But you know, John Hader, the great architect, once said that uh, uh, the closer a finished building is to its drawn precursor to the sketch, the better it is. In other words, 
Much get lost, gets lost in the act of building, even with somebody as reductive as Mies van der Rohe himself. So the, the drawn object, or the, the original concept, as it were, is the power. And so John further said, in order to be an architect for John, you had to have done at least two buildings built that qualified as architecture. In other words, that looked like were close enough to the original concept that there was basically no measurable distance. And that was proved in his fact, case largely by that fabulous project uh, called the Wall House, which was then built actually after his death in um, the Netherlands and is quite beautiful. But the, the sketches, the drawings for the Wall House, you didn't need to see the building. It was exactly what the building was. So the next is this black barn for an owner recently deceased and they sold it. Um, you know, they don't tell young people that you, that you may live long enough to see your buildings be demolished, um, basically die, fall apart, etc. cetera. Um, so to me, it's very sad to look at this because the people for whom it was done were amazing. He was a veterinarian. She was a painter, a weaver, actually, sorry. Uh, and they bought a piece of property, a farm, in the Berrien Springs, Michigan, and they commissioned me to do a residence for them. I use the word carefully, residence. And on the, on the property was a barn and a house. So I said, and they, he wanted to raise sheep. So I said, let's put the sheep in the house and you in the barn. <laughs> and they did, amazingly enough. So we remodeled this barn, which is black shingles, sides, the roof, the walls, everything, with an arrow in black glass pointing into the ground. And he had white, his face is a huge pond with white swans in it. And he had an organ in the base of, the, of this barn. And you can imagine the stories in the neighbor, with the neighbors, the neighboring farmers thought of, he, they, they must have thought he, he was a black magic uh, witch of some sort. <laughs> but, it, but by doing it, it forced me to rethink residentiality. And it became a critique of the house, house qua house, you know, this thing, house. This is another example. This is a house in Highland Park on um, it's North Park, just east of Ridge Road, right? On the south side of the street. Yes. So everybody thought it was, that there was a change in zoning because there's something like nine buildings. Uh, it was fragmented so that the, that the, the idea of house as containment uh, was no longer an issue. And it, and it was all, there was an armature, which was this shape, very large, which became the, the operatic stage. It was a stage set with buildings as actors on stage. And you wandered between the buildings or rooms in the armature itself. So it was, I, when we, we put this together, uh, I didn't have, we didn't have the image, or I don't know where it is, probably it resides with you, Nathaniel, of the, the aerial. There's an aerial shot of this that's knockout that shows the nine buildings about the armature. You just have to take my word for it. And then again, they, they passed away, and they, the children sold it. Sad. This is another case of a critique. And it might as well be a critique of the building on its left, which is, you see, in a rust color, which is by Michael Graves. 
This is on the, on the South Island of Fukuoka, where Nagasaki and Hiroshima are. And um, there was an experimental project that was done, uh, fostered by Isozaki, who was the advisor to the Fukuoka Jisho Bank of Japan, who funded filling in a piece of the Sea of Japan. So all of this is built on former on the former Sea of Japan. So the, the land, it's all artificial. Um, and Michael and Iso asked me to do this building. So, because I, you know, I've always been a critic, first of my own work and then of others. And so this is a criticism of a building, you know, that building that, how do I say, when Mies had the Vosmuth exhibition in Berlin in 1910, uh, all the European architects went to see the exhibition of Wright. And they were all blown away because Frank Lloyd Wright in the 19th century, broke out of the box. How do you break out of a box? At the corner. You do it like so. You know, because and I know this for a fact. Renaissance buildings, which are the archetype of the Greek temple, are coined with dressed stones at the corner to contain the box so that it's, you know, you're against nature, as it were. My, I always, how do I say this cogently? Paul Rudolph tried and failed to turn me into a modern architect because I resisted asymmetry because of the human body, which biomorphically speaking is symmetrical about one axis but layered on the other axis. And I had a hell of a time breaking through that. Um, so the building on the left, which is by Michael Graves, who was operating within the tradition, the hello tradition, of architecture from a classic tradition. He recommended me, who I in turn then deconstructed what he was doing, which he was not thrilled by. <laughs> in fact, you may recall, Margaret, that he said publicly on several occasions, he was, and I know it for a fact, he was not thrilled by this. Um, so this is, how, you know, how do you attack or criticize um, the basic concept, which is the root of your work, architecture, the classic tradition? You do it by uh, using measurement. First of all, you hollow out the center. You do an atrium. So there is no center. You take away the center. Frank Lloyd Wright, you know, Tom Beebe has written beautifully about uh, Wright. In Wright's way, you may think he was a naturalist, but the center of his houses were always a flame. They were always the fireplace. In other words, he had a black view of his duel with nature. He, he may have said that architecture is of the hill, not on the hill or at the bottom of the hill, but in, you know, in context of the hill. But the fact is, the center of a Frank Lloyd Wright house is in fact, period, end of statement, if in flames. He was ripping apart the very thin thing that he was being seen as venerating nature itself. In my case, because I never, I mean, this is one of the rare cases of, of something I did that was asymmetrical entirely. Um, in my case, I broke it apart and then as you see, saw with the um, Baha'i bipartite scheme, that was my way of contending with symmetry in, na in nature and, and the classical tradition, I should say, by cleaving it, in other words, by rupturing it. I did it in Berlin in the building I did, etc. So this one is done to the use of measurement. 
Um, in this case, the measurement are two meters. Those squares that you see as superimposed on the building are seen as scaffolding. And, but you know, you, soon, you know, why measurability is crucial to understanding buildings. If you know the size of a brick, which you're at, for your edification, is two and, two and five eighths by three and three quarter by eight. If you know the size of a brick and you see a building made out of brick, you can go count the bricks and you know the size of the building. I mean, that's what we have students do all the time. And it's a fabulous way to understand a building is to understand its size or its scale. So by working with scalar devices is my way, even as it's pulled apart, of you understanding the building, because you can measure the tile. This is another example of that. This Pacific Garden Mission here at 15th and Canal for the uh, Pacific Garden Mission is the oldest, largest homeless shelter in the United States. It sleeps 1,200. It feeds 2,000 in three sittings for each of three meals a day. So 18, um, and it has an, a cloister, an atrium. I mean, in this case, there's a reason, another reason for the atrium. Um, you know, there but for the grace of God go I. How many architects uh, like Louis Sullivan ended their life as an alcoholic living in a linen closet in a hotel? How many architects have succumbed to alcoholism, for example? So that when I was commissioned to do this project, to me it was absolutely thrilling because you always want to do a project where the poignancy is the program. And if there's a poignant thing in the United States, it's homelessness. So this has a cloister. Why does it have a cloister? It has a user-friendly cloister with very full-grown trees today. Um, because what it is, it, what, it feel, what it must feel to be homeless, uh, where people don't look at you, where you smell bad because you don't bathe regularly, where people avoid you. How would you like to be a non-person in a certain sense? Or how many of us uh, want a person a homeless person asks for money. Do you not just give them money, but do you stop and talk to them? How many of us actually do that? Um, these are issues, I think, that are both ethically challenging, uh, but they represent other things as well. So, I wanted to make an outdoor space that would be friend user friendly to the homeless where they could look in on themselves to find an outdoor space under trees with grass and street furniture that belonged to them, that was surrounded by a 20-foot wide hallway with a yellow floor called the Yellow Brick Road, which has street lamps, outdoor waste receptacles, outdoor street furniture, Etc. Because I wanted to make the place user friendly for the homeless because they didn't have an outdoor space that was user friendly in urban America. Your neighbors and mine in Chicago. Um, so the building, you know, it took an arm and a leg for me to talk the uh, evangelical ministers who run this facility into basically pissing away a huge area where there is no budget and turning it into an atrium. Um, and I, that's where the, it's not that I'm courageous, it's not meant to be self-serving, because I'm not a good guy. 
Um, but you need to fight to get what you want. And so I talked them into it, and they bought it. And it was stepped back above without roof leaking. Haven't heard a word about that. Um, so that the sun can penetrate down to this central uh, atrium, cloister, which has properly at the end, as you see by the cross, a small chapel, which is entered the right way from the west facing east, and they worship there and they work out and they, and they walk, walk back out in the west and die in the body and blood of Christ in the east. So it's oriented properly. Um, so it was important to me to, to do something. Let's just say I love going there. I, had, I, re, I went there recently. Oh, because with what's her name? Doing the movie. And there's a, a, a documentary being made by the Columbia College Film Department. And we went there. And it's, it's always great to go back because you know, there I'm remembered, and we have we have a great relationship. Let's just say, because they knew that I, that I treated them in, as they were important. So, and then the Holocaust Museum. Holocaust Museum was a tough project. Another a very important project for me. You could say, well, because you're Jewish. No, not really, because I, you know, I had done, I really should have shown St. Benedict's Abbey, because there's as much symbolism that I did for Benedictine monks in Wisconsin 40 years ago as there is for the Jews in Skokie. Uh, but to the building itself, um, Hallie Rosen, who may be here, uh, works now for Lynn, but she worked originally at the Holocaust Museum. And I was talking to her before uh, we began. Um, and I, uh, we were reminiscing about the building of this project and the difficulty and because now your governor was the chairman of the board of the Holocaust Museum, J.B. Pritzker. And J.B., who's a nice guy, but like the British use language as a weapon, he uses money as a weapon. And I was on the wrong side of the money. I was spending the money <laughs> on the building. And so, I, uh, I invented a client because I did had problems with the board of the Holocaust Museum. Um, and they were the, the survivors. Because Holocaust survivors are another matter. They're fabulous. Because one thing is for sure, they're brave. There was a couple old ladies my age about this tall on me. And I'm five, I was five, six. I'm five, three and a half. They got to be four ten, four nine, maybe four eight. These two old ladies, sisters, were in Auschwitz, Birkenau. So I said, "How the hell did you survive Auschwitz, Birkenau?" And they said, "You don't want to ask." And I knew what they meant. I mean, it, they must have. It must have been without troubling your imagination. It must have been hellacious. In any case, I loved them. These old people were fab, I mean, knockout. Where the children, the children of Holocaust survivors, it's not so great to be, say, a Jew or a black or a minority in a majority white wasp culture, basically. Not so easy. So basically, the children of survivors are problematic in my mind because they want to get along. Therefore, they never speak their mind. I've never had that problem, obviously. <laughs> um, 
So, but the building is loaded with, so in doing it for them, I realized that in one of the criticisms that one needed to make by doing this building was to say, guess what, folks? Judaism is alive and well. In other words, Hitler, the Third Reich, Hitler and his minions, uh, had an agenda, which was to kill all of the Jews in Europe and England, which were six million in number, and 12 million in number, they managed to kill six. Imagine, I mean, it's unbelievable. Uh, so, but, by, but by building a Holocaust museum, I needed to load it up with symbolism so that people who did get it would understand what the building really is about. But it is not about, I mean, I can talk about the Holocaust, and the building is about that too, but not about really what the building is about. So before the building opened, then Cardinal George came to visit the building, and I was assigned the task of taking him around. And I was thrilled, absolutely thrilled, that he knew all of the symbolism. You know, why, why, why should I have been thrilled? That's his job. He's supposed to know both the Old and the New Testament. And he did know. And he knew when the 18 windows, which stood for in Hebrew high or life uh, in this penultimate space, he knew what that meant. He knew what those two columns were precisely, because those are the columns of Solomon's temple, deconstructed, so it's just a structure. They are the right size by the text. 1 Kings 5 through 9, they're the right diameter, the right height, etc. The right intercolumnation, etc. The plan, everything in the building has, in one way or another, is loaded with, the, with symbolism. And the building is designed in cubits. This, for your edification, is a cubit, which is nominally a half meter. A cubit is the biblical measurement, like a foot, that is our foot. Uh, those are biblical ways of measuring. So the building is designed in cubits, but of course cubits do not relate to feet and inches. So there's a disconnect. It's sort of like uh, right across the river, well, at this juncture at Michigan and the river, there's a disconnect. Michigan Avenue, as you know, shifts. Do you know why that is? Anybody? Chicago is a grid, a Jeffersonian or Spanish, 100 by 100 meter grid, or 100 by 200 meter. For Chicago, the blocks are 1 by 200 meters, in the, the rectangles. Uh, that was laid on a flat plane, but it's not a flat plane. The earth is round. And so to, to pick up for that discrepancy, you'll find that certain streets, there's a disconnect. As you'll find in the country, when you look at hectares or, or, um, or um, acres, and uh, a farm is so many by so many acres, that grid is every so often, there's a, there's a disjunction because it's around, it's a sphere. And that's accommodated with uh, Euclid, with Euclidean geometry through the disjunction. So this building is just is loaded with symbolism. To say nothing of it's cleaved. Literally, it's half a building is black, half is white. Half has no windows, the other is all windows. The one is dark, is you enter it on the left, and it's one way. Most buildings you would leave here in the way you came. You generally go in and come back the same way. Boring. You know, <laughs> if you actually enter a building and go out another way, that, that's a more of a metaphor of life. And for the Jews, of course, the, in the Holocaust, it was premature death. It was one way. It's a one-way trip, you're dead, period. So this is a building that you enter in the darkness with no windows, just large-scale punka devices. Punka device, which is to get an airplane that you f fiddle with to get air in your seat, the thing above you. 
These are huge, huge, gigantic, which, of course, is a metaphor for the gas chambers. Um, so the, you enter in the dark building and you descend into, into darkness, into finally in, into the Holocaust itself. And then you, and you rise in the white building with the hope of a future and never again, quote unquote. The space in the middle is uninhabitable by humans, but you can look into it. It is my space that is devoted for the deceased, those who died. So to me, that was very important in doing this building was to do a space for them that was not for, and you know, as time goes on, because buildings change, you have to adapt and ownership adapts, it's a continuous adaptation. So the, the Holocaust people, uh, including my nephew who's in charge of exhibits, trying to futz and figure out, screw around, how do you get in to use that space? They have been unsuccessful so far. And with any luck, I'll die before they, they'll figure it out at some point. Just like somebody will figure out at some point when we do the Bar Association, what the ornament on the bronze doors to the elevator is. But I'm not telling, you figure it out. Because there is, they represent something. And you're supposed to be smart, Nathaniel. You figure it out. Um, so, finally, you know, that's the critique that I'm really talking about. Uh, when it was done, it was done in 78. James Ingo Fried was then the Dean of Architecture at IIT. He was a really good old friend who had gone to Hyde Park High School, but who grew up in Germany and left Berlin in 1940. How he left, how he, a, a Jew survived in Berlin until 1940, escapes one. But he, you know, he survived. So Jim, or Ingo as I called him, as his friends knew him, was uh, at my office one night, and we're sitting talking, and I had this idea about this. And he really propped me up. He said, do it. He was, I mean, truly, not ironically, but he was truly supportive as the dean of IIT. Uh, but it was an important statement to make. The, the people misconstrue it as my angst with Mies van der Rohe. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Mies was the closest thing to somebody that I admired, a, a godlike figure in my eyes, my whole life. My problem was, was with his successors, who never really got it to this day. I mean, if, Mies, if you look at a Mies building at the roof line, you'll see it when you go home tonight, Reed, since you live on the top floor, you'll see a coped angle going out over the building. The building is here, and this takes the rain off of it. But when I went to Skidmore, we worked in the Air Force Academy, they did it at the bottom as well, because they never got it. They did a, a, a stupid kind of symmetry. Well, this is just airing some dirty laundry. Um, <laughs> But to me, you know, Mies was a heroic figure, without doubt. Yes, he was terrible with women. Yes, he was flawed in a number of ways. But as an architect, no question in my mind. And he saw things as, as criticism. So I want to leave you with that. Um, it seems to me that when you look at buildings, when you look at a really good building, what you consider a good building, you know, is there implicit in it a critique rooted in decent language and done with respect, but is there a critique, is there a criticism?